Welcome back to the Musicians Insight Podcast. My name is Jeff Jopic. I'm an Atlanta-based music educator and trumpet player. Um, I sit down here at this podcast and talk with incredible musicians from all corners of the music industry about music, life, the business of being a musician, um, equipment, uh, technique, uh, some of those things that I definitely want to talk to um, my guest today about. Um, and uh, my guest today is uh, Joshua Kaufman. Um, what's your rank in the military? I'm, I'm, I'm a staff sergeant, E6. Staff sergeant, Staff Sergeant Josh Kaufman. Um, Josh is a lead trumpet and solo trumpet player in the U.S. Army Blues, which is the premier jazz band of the U.S. Army, um, formerly a lead trumpet at the Un uh, University of North Texas One O'Clock One O'Clock Band, um, an absolute all-around incredible lead trumpet player, solo trumpet player. Um, one thing that I find so incredible about his playing is the um, is the the style, the old sort of the old style he can play in in like a um, uh, Harry James, Louis Armstrong, but also a very, you know, new contemporary style of jazz playing and lead playing and everything in between, uh, classical playing. Um, so I'm super excited to sit down with him today. Um, Josh, one thing that sort of sparked my uh, desire to do something like this was our conversation. I had a conversation with you previously, a few, maybe a few months ago. Um, where I just wanted to sit yeah, down. And, yeah, I just wanted to sit down and chat. Um, um, you know, get your advice on a few things. I also sat down with um, somebody that I'm also having on my podcast, um, Kevin Paul, who's also in the U.S. Uh, Army, not U.S. Army Blues, the U.S. Pershing Zone, um, and just sitting down with with musicians from you know different walks of life, people doing different things, and you know, COVID is one of these times where people have a lot of time and they're hopefully willing to to do some chatting with some other people. So I was really uh, grateful that you sat down with me that time and that you are joining me again here today. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very excited. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts sort of on this, on this COVID time and, and talking to different musicians and seeing different things going on? You know, everything's going a different direction with virtual things and stuff like that. Um, what are you sort of doing with the whole thing? Um, I mean, it, if you would have told me in March of 2020, I was just getting ready to play a show at the Kennedy Center, and it was one of my favorite books to play. And they, you know, they closed the theater down, and I remember I was actually a guest artist at Liberty University that weekend. It was like March 13th or 14th when, like, all the shutdown started. Mm -hmm. and I remember coming home. My wife called and said everything was going on, and I was like, well, I'll stop at the grocery store and get a few things, you know, just to keep us at home for a few days. And you told me <laughs> at that time that we would still be here now, I would have said, you're crazy. There's no mm. way. Um, so this obviously has lasted probably much longer than any of us would have anticipated. Uh, however, you know, I try to always find the positive. You know, I, I definitely can't have my grumpy moments, but I try to always find the good in every situation. Mm -hmm. and something that's been really, really nice for me is that I've never, um, since coming to D.C., uh, right out of college, too, which has sort of a disadvantage in my eyes. Um, I was always trying to just juggle the job and the, you know, civilian work and studio work and all these other things, just trying to make sure that I could like get from one gig to the next, you know, and do what I needed to do. During COVID, it's been incredible <clears throat> to reach back into stuff that I haven't had a chance to really focus on and, and work on and sort of polish since I was at the University of North Texas. So I've spent a lot of time on my C trumpet, on piccolo trumpet, a lot of classical etudes and just various parts of my playing that sort of didn't necessarily get neglected, but um, things that I wasn't being paid to do. You know, I, I'm in the mm -hmm. blues by day and, you know, I don't have to multiple tongue in there all the time. So pulling out my arbins and going through the multiple tongue sections has been really helpful. So it's been incredible to kind of have somewhat of a fresh start, so to speak, during COVID. You know, I <clears throat> wrote out a new routine and, and worked on various things in my playing that I just, like I said, again, wasn't able to ever do because 
you know, if I start working on one thing too much, then the other thing suffers, right? It's this constant push and pull and this balance act that we all have to do as versatile musicians. Um, so that, that has been really fun for me to reach out to players that I haven't talked to in a while and dig into books that I haven't seen in a long time. And not only that, but um, I've been working from home a lot. I've been teaching a lot more than I ever thought I would. I've always had a few students, but now I teach quite a bit. And uh, I record a lot from home. And I, and I think I've talked to some other very reputable players that are in the, the business that I think our, our line of work is forever changed because of this. You know, why, why look at your, and this is in no way like a good or bad thing towards any one person, but like if I'm in such and such a city and my best bud is in this city, why would I call anyone from my city when I can just call him to record my track for me and send it back? And so I've done a lot of things like that not for better or for worse. I just think now it's different now that people know that, Oh, we can put these tracks together, this and that and make it sound just as good. Um, it looks like maybe things will go that route. I really hope they don't. There's nothing more exciting than playing in the room with everybody in a studio session. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the remote thing. It's just the only thing that COVID has, has proven is that it can be done and it can be done. So whether that's a good thing or bad thing yet, I don't know. Um, but that's sort of what I've been doing for the past almost a year now. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned like multiple tongue and classical stuff. I find that when I'm doing something, um, you know, jazz related or, or I'm, I'm heavily involved in a, in a big band or in a recording session season or, or doing something like that, um, I don't play as much classical trumpet. Do you, right. do you get paid to play classical trumpet? Like, do you switch to the Pershing Zone, like the classical side? Do you get calls for that stuff? Well, at least specific to the Army Band, to, to Pershing's own, um, you know, one of the unique parts about our job is that if you look at, like, an entire calendar year, with everybody involved at 2SAB, I think there's, like, a, I don't know, 250 musicians, 240, between every single one of us, down from, like, a single harpist that might play at the cheapest staff of the Army's house, to like a bugler at a cemetery, to like a 99 piece band at an inaugural and all these concerts. If you add like everything together, we do between six to 7,000 missions jobs a year, which is like an unbelievable enough. It's yeah. more than one else even gets close to. Um, and so one of the cool things about our job is that while I am a trumpet player in the army blues, and you mentioned one of my best friends, Kevin Paul, who's a trumpet player in the ceremonial band, we all sort of have to play this acrobatic act at times where like I might be needed in the concert band because they're commercial players on leave or they just need another trumpet player. And so th I've been used for that or we'll combine the blues and elements of our rock band and concert band into like this studio orchestra for another job that we'll do. And so then you have like commercial horn players with string players and all these things and playing lead in that is different than playing lead in a big band. You know, if like if we're playing, like Broadway type music. That's a very different role that we have. Um, and, you know, various brass quintets are needed or, you know, we're all used as buglers. When I, when I went to audition for the Army Blues, part of my audition was playing like, I think, a, some simple bugle calls and then a few marches. And something I've realized, and, and I think this is a good thing, that if Freddie Hubbard could come walking through the door, if we can't send him out into Arlington Cemetery to play taps, you, we just can't hire that person. Mm -hmm. So versatility is so hugely important. And now we're starting to see, um, you know, like, I think it was like a concert band trombone audition or something. They had some like jazz etude on there. And I thought that was super cool because um, we just have to have this sort of balancing act. But as a civilian, uh, so in the job, yes, I will play classical trumpet from time to time. And then as a civilian, I, I do quite a bit of, of classical playing. My goal in life is always to been to play my jazz and my commercial gigs and have them not know that I play classical trumpet and then play my classical gigs and have them not know that I'm a commercial trumpet player. I yeah. really like the balancing act. It's really difficult, um, but he's right there. This guy up here has proven that it's possible. That's a portrait of Wynton Marsalis, who's my hero. And I have a funny story about how I discovered his classical playing, but he proved that it can be done, you know, and he's still the only musician on earth that proved it could be done at an incredibly high level. With his, one you know, of the highest level on both ends, in, in, in a lot of people's opinion. So it's possible. And I, and I do try to do that. I, I, um, 
I don't know. I just love all music and I get bored if I start, even, I love the army blues, but if I just do nothing but big band for a few months, I start to get really bored. So I enjoy doing different things all the time. Yeah. Listening to, I just had a conversation with Dave Detweiler. Um, one of my favorite human beings in the entire world. I've He's been for like 15. It's, it's weird to think, you know, I'm, I'm a relatively young person, 23 years old, just got out of college. But to think that I've known somebody for 15 years, is yeah. a really cool thing. Um, he's just hilarious, and, and I love chatting with him. Uh, and a great player. Fantastic. I got to sit next to him and listen to him play every day for probably 10, 8, 10 years, which was yeah. the biggest privilege ever. Um, but to hear stories about all the playing that he did um, in the Army, you know, being a part of the Army Blues and Pershing Zone and things like that, um, and then to hear what you're saying about, like, you know, being part of a studio orchestra or getting to play taps or getting to play with the ceremonial band. It really is, you know, being a military musician really does sound kind of like a dream job for a, at least a trumpet player. It is, you know, I mean, um, when I, I went, I went to North Texas with the idea of wanting to be a studio musician. And the whole reason why I wanted to be a studio musician is because I, I wanted to be able to walk into a situation where I just don't know what I'm going to play that day. And I, and I also had the understanding having, I think part of my, part of my senior project in high school was to interview like somebody I wanted who, whose job that I sort of wanted in the future. So I did an interview with Rick Baptist and he and I talked and basically I learned then that the more hats you can wear, the more work you're going to get called for. So I sort of went to North Texas with that idea in mind. And I studied classical trumpet. I studied jazz. I had like three trumpet teachers every semester. I had like three, two to three trumpet lessons every week. Um, and just for four years, just kind of hustled constantly on the trumpet. But when I was a senior, and after I had studied with Paul Stevens, he had really got me interested in the military bands because it allowed me the option to have a really great job out of the bat. It had, I think I came to the job, I was 21, maybe 22. Um, I don't remember. Um, but I was able to come out of school, have a really great job with a steady you know, paycheck, health benefits, pension, retirement, all those good things without having to sort of... Um, climb the ladder of life you know no matter how good you are there's a certain hierarchy that has to happen in any city that you would move to and there's nothing wrong with that it's like you go to a contractor and he may love you but he's like well here's the 10 guys that i call who should i kick off the list to put you on so yeah. it's nothing personal that's just the way it works um but the military band is sort of um you know you have the opportunity to if you're a good player you come to an audition you win the job you win the job and so that was really important for me because my my girlfriend at the time who's now my wife we were very serious and i didn't want to she did really didn't have an interest in moving to like a big city and trying to make it mm -hmm. um so this kind of had a the military jobs have an incredible balance between having that musical career that we all dream of but then being able to provide for my family without ever having to worry like is something going to happen? What if I, you know, don't get called for this or that or whatever? And then you can play as much on the outside as you want. You know, that's up to you. Yeah. Um, and I know you guys did a lot of live concerts. I love watching Army Blues, like, recordings on YouTube where they do great you okay. know, audio and, and film recording. And it, I'm speaking more of, like, the full big band, you know, back in the, back in the day, like, a year and a half ago. Um, yeah the real big band gigs um but now you guys are doing a lot more i i think i've seen some virtual stuff right where you had there was one where you had a uh a latin musician was wasn't that a virtual type of deal or yeah that? yeah we've been doing virtual concerts this whole time you know following covid and mm -hmm. you know um, cdc protocols and all that stuff we we do have uh many groups outside th that grow out of the army blues so we mm -hmm. have a like a trad jazz group called Swamp Romp. We have a Latin music ensemble. And so those groups have been playing. And I put together a Louis Armstrong Hot 5, Hot 7 tribute concert that's available online. That was phenomenal. <laughs> but it, it, if you haven't oh, seen, if anybody hasn't seen that concert, um, going back to what I was saying in the very beginning, your, and I would love to, to touch on this a little bit, your sure. style in that, um, you know, in that genre of that very specific Louis Armstrong, um, you know, uh, 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 Harry James and, and all those old guys that have, it's just a different sound. It's a different way vibrato. It's a different way of articulating. It's a different way of 
of everything. And so it, it sounds like you're listening to Liz Armstrong when you listen to that concert. It's very- oh, thanks. I really appreciate that. Um, it, it, th- those concerts have been really nice because, um, you know, the band, uh, uh, we're known as like 2SAB. So if I say 2SAB, it's like the United States Army band. That's what I mean. 2SAB needed like ideas because at, at, at the beginning of the, of the quarantine and all that stuff, I think we were putting out like two or three concerts every week. So there was like this constant need to generate material. So it allowed a lot of soldiers that, you know, I was a new guy, allow us to maybe actually speak up and say, well, I have an idea. And they'd say, sure, let's hear it because they needed programs. And so, like I said, I did the Louis Armstrong thing. Um, I produced the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day concert. So we wore like the old uh, pink and green uniforms from World War II and we played like Glenn Miller and all these other things and I did an interview about my grandfather who's a World War II vet and uh, so that was really cool um, and now recently actually just last week we recorded I think three different concerts that'll air throughout the spring mm-hmm. but the blues has been able we have something it's called I think they're calling it like our exploded setup but we were able in our hall to set up on stage. Everybody's six feet apart. We have these special musician masks and things like that. And so we recorded as full blues for the first time in a while. And it was weird because I've been playing a full big band for a while, but then we're all six feet apart. And I feel like, you know, the drummer's like a quarter mile away and we had to like get set up with headphones and things like that. But, I, you know, making the best out of what we can, you know, knowing that we were allowed to come into work, if we can set up in a safe way, that was just en- enough for all of us to say, well, let's see if we can just figure this out. Mm-hmm. And so it took a little bit of practice and rehearsal, but I, I, I think the product in the end ended up being really good. Is that when you so, guys were showing off the new uh, Hirschman mutes? You yeah. Said, you, you said you, you posted a video <clears throat> of that. I yeah. Think. And was incredibly generous to uh, send the section a set of the KR Indigo plungers. Twi- yep. I love it. I love it. I mean, I've got my whole collection of mutes. I've got a bazillion plungers that I've experimented with and cut this out or drilled this or add this or whatever. And the, the KR Indigo plungers are by far my favorite. And so the whole section plays them now. And I already had a set, but so now I have another one. So I like keep one at work and a couple at home. Mm-hmm. And, My uh, funniest thing for, for Christmas this year, um, I, so backstory, I, uh, I'm marrying into this summer, I'm marrying into a family of five former or current trumpet players. Oh, how cool. So, so how- my, my future father-in-law is uh, still an actively trumpet player in Atlanta. Um, okay. his, his wife was a music major, played piano, sang and, and played trumpet. Um, my fiance did her first year in the Auburn University marching band on trumpet, and then she switched to being a dancer. Uh, her brother, I marched with on trumpet for five years, and her dog, uh, her sister, you know, everybody plays trumpet. That is so awesome. it, it was it was incredible. Um, and he, so I, and he's actually, if you've heard of Bach Loyalist, have you heard of, uh, of the Bach yeah. Loyalist? That's him. That's my father in law. Hey, how cool. Man, I go yeah. on that website all the time to like research <laughs> like a cool horn I find or whatever. Yeah, so, so he has serial number 212, serial number 224. Um, he has like 15. He has the only Bach rotary trumpet in existence that people know of. Like he has everything. So we go over and nerd out and play high notes, and, and it's really funny. But I got him a uh, Hirschman plunger, and like two days before Christmas, I was like, hey, so you know, gotten any new mutes lately? And he was like, yeah, I got this uh, cut mute. I was like, did you, get a, did you get one of those plungers that we've been talking about? And he was like, yeah, I, I got one to test out. I love it. And I had already gotten his. Um, uh-huh. And then, so on Christmas, I still gave him it to him. And it was, I was just gonna be like, yeah, I don't know what you're gonna do, but here's another one. So <laughs> I got one for him. He got one for me. And he got one for his wife. And he had right. one. So we, had, we just had a very big exchange of, of those plungers. Yeah. Um, you can never have- yeah yeah he he's he's incredible he's hilarious it's hilarious the situation um you know the opportunity that i have to play with a great musician and learn i mean he knows so much about the very early box stuff and he has a bunch of box stuff and he has like three new york uh mouthpiece cases full of of old mouthpieces wow. and i'm surprised um, he's very into the family and you play a shoki i know well he actually I- plays a tailor he, oh wow so yeah he doesn't even play Bach um and he <laughs> loved he loves my shoki though um yeah. but uh yeah it was a really funny situation um and and on you were talking sort of about the concerts that you were doing 
on with like the the Louis Armstrong like style. Where did where did that come from for you? Where did you know the love of that or the learning how to do that? Because not everybody can do that. I can't do that. Lots of people can't do that. Sure. So, I mean, really, it's how I got my start on trumpet. So, like I said um, a little bit earlier, my grandfather he's uh, ninety five years old, and uh, he'll be ninety six this year. He was a World War II veteran, and he always called jazz the music that won the war. I mean, he loved big band music. He actually, um, there was like a program or something called Swing and Sway with Sammy Kay, who was a very well-known big band leader. And he would let like World War II soldiers at the time of the war go up and conduct the band. And so he actually had the opportunity to go up and conduct Sammy Kay's band. And Sammy gave him the baton and was real nice about it. But told my grandfather, just stick to sailoring. And uh, <laughs> I was just from that background, you know, and I, and I was, I grew up as being incredibly close to my grandfather. I'm talking like I would stay out there for so long. My parents would have to call and just make, you know, ask my grandma, you know, is Josh okay? He's been there for like, you know, in the summer, it's like two weeks, you know, I just wanted to be there all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, he always had records playing. He, he really favored trombone playing band leaders. Now, I don't know if that's because at the time, like Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey were like two of the biggest. Mm-hmm. Um, but at any rate, those were the players he really liked. And then I heard Ray Anthony and Harry James. But sort of the deciding moment for me was, uh, this is a movie everyone should go see if they haven't. Um, we were watching the Benny Goodman story together. And this was years before I start, ever started playing. And I'd always heard music, but as a kid, like, you know, like I grew up with TV he didn't so like I liked visual things and you know whatever Mm -hmm. and there's a part in the Carnegie Hall concert that's really famous where Harry James pays tribute to Louis Armstrong because just a quick story Harry James was infatuated with Louis Armstrong it's in my opinion I think that's the only reason he played a summer balanced trumpet in the first place Mm -hmm. um we could talk about that history whenever um but he pays tribute in the Carnegie Hall uh Carnegie Hall concert to Louis Armstrong and he plays the tune Shine and he just plays the crap out of it of course being Harry James and um, but in the movie they got Harry to come in and act as himself and so I saw Harry and I saw him miming to the the recording and I was just like Pappy who is that what is that that's what I'm doing that's what I'm going to play and uh, so he was also a pastor and uh, there was like a, a somebody in the congregation had an old beat up King trumpet and gave it to my dad and said, you know, when I get my two front teeth, I can start playing the trumpet. That was their advice. So I was probably the only like seven, eight year old kid trying to get his two front teeth to come out. Like dad, I think it's loose enough. See if you can pull it out, you know, but at any rate, that was sort of my background was nothing but swing music. And even when I started playing trumpet, um, I mean, it took me years before, maybe like even the very end of high school before I ever really wanted to actually like sit and transcribe something. I just liked sitting and listening to records and, and like throughout middle school and high school, I was really reluctant to practice arbins and like the things that we all do to work on technique and pedagogy, which is what I obsess about now. Um, you know, I had trumpet teachers drop me in high school because I wouldn't practice. All I wanted to do is play with records, play with grandpa's records. And at the time, Maybe I felt like a failure because, you know, my teachers didn't like me or I couldn't play these etudes or this, that, whatever. But if I could go back in time and learn that way again, and just, like I said, for years, all I did was just sit and play with records. And, you know, before I even knew what a shake was, I just heard it and was like, oh, I wonder how they get that sound and would try weird things and try to see if I could emulate them. Um, I would learn that way 100% again and figure out the pedagogy later. Um, I think it allowed me to develop such a, a deep, a, yeah, a deep way of listening, you know, like uh, some of my own students um, who are all great players, sometimes they'll say like, oh, I'm listening to Lee Morgan, uh, but it's just not coming out in my playing. And I'll say, what have you been listening to? Sing me a Lee Morgan solo, play me a Lee Morgan solo. Who, what have you been listening to? What record? Oh, I found it on Spotify. And I'm like, okay. So you're not actively, you're not going into like a dark room putting your headphones on and just listening or even playing along, you know, they have it on with their homework, this, that, whatever, which I have music playing all the time as well. Um, But I'm talking about actively listening, just devoted to, I'm going to spend this next 30, 45 minutes of just listening. And so I think 
as a young kid, you know, especially, especially, you know, the younger kids are a little bit more impressionable. That's like why when you're learning piano, they want you to start out really young because like for me, I really struggled playing piano as an aside in college. Like I, I really mm-hmm. had a long time. I never started until I got to college. Um, but hearing jazz for my entire life for nine years before I even touched a trumpet, I think that just, it was just in my ear. You know, I could sit and whistle Bobby Hackett's solo to String of Pearls years before I even started playing the trumpet. You know, I would just sit there and sing the solo to String of Pearls or hearing Ray Anthony's recording of Stairway to the Stars or this or that or Young Man with a Horn. Um, so I think it just gave me a special ability, praise God, to just hear that way and sort of emulate. Because for some people, that's that's a really difficult skill. And, and so when I, I get this question a lot, people ask, how do you do that? And I just think it, before you touch the trumpet, and it goes the same for like commercial and classical veins, you have to have an incredibly crystal clear mental concept of what your sound needs to be. You know, you can change mouthpieces and horns and all this fancy stuff. And I have a balance. I have a Harry James Selmer in my case. I'll play on swing jobs because it's it's like more sentimental to me than anything. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you, you know, your sound is your sound and you can easily manipulate your sound by whatever sort of mental concept you have in mind, you know, I mean, you, you know, this, you, you could probably play your really small Bob Reeves and back off and probably still get a dark sound. And then obviously you put the jets to it and it does something completely different. Mm-hmm. So I think too many people, um, I, I don't know if they're not, a, if they're afraid to try it or especially with the earlier um, players, because at that time it was less about, interesting harmony and all this stuff and 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 it was more about style and interpretation you know like if you hear like the way Louis Armstrong played with vibrato or like Harry James's use of uh, like various tonguing or or even like Clark Terry and doodle tonguing and stuff like that a lot of those things have in some ways players haven't just spent as much time checking that stuff out because we're all worried about coming up with like the most harmonically cool stuff when it you know at least for me in my line of work most of my my jazz jobs around the country and even around the world um, have been playing for like Lindy Hop national and international championship dances and stuff. And I'm like, that's kind of a cool thing to seeing like thousands of people like dancing to Benny Goodman, you know, yeah. where all these people come from, but they're out there. So, you know, I don't play a ton of like small group jazz. I, I do sometimes, but most of my jazz work is like people call me to say, hey, can you come do a Harry James concert or this or that or whatever? Um, but as, as far as the listening, I think it's just having a very crystal clear idea of what it should sound like and, and being able to sing that stuff too. I think vocalizing helps. It's really helped me develop my plunger technique when I was young as well. Cause that was another thing I was really into uh, vocalizing and singing. Um, not only that, but um, just, you just have to be confident in what you're you, you know, like I'm in the confines of my own room, you know, I'll, I'll sit and try different things that I heard Lewis do or Harry and I might not figure it out at first, but I'll just sit and kind of mess around or like now we have the glorious thing of YouTube, which can also be equally bad. But I mean, the fact that I can just Google Harry James and now I can like slow it down to like quarter speed, I'll put it full screen and I'll just like stare at him and like, man, what is he doing right there and try to figure it out, you know, um, you know, I, with the sound right. stuff, I, 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 I totally agree with you. And, and I, I don't do as much listening to the older stuff for sure. Um, my fascination is more with like the big, brilliant lead sound. And, sure. and I, I, I think it might be because that comes a little bit more naturally to me, you know, like when that's something that I can achieve, but like, I, I've, I've seen you did a, you played along with the transcription of uh, Louis Armstrong's hotter hotter than that hotter than that yep um and i've i've tried it uh you know there have been like 10 days you know across two years where i've been like i'm gonna get a good recording of this i'm gonna try i'm gonna do it uh 50 times and and just the stuff doesn't come out like uh, do you do something do you think about something specific do you do something specific with those the small shakes and the and the the sound and there's just so much more there's so much nuance to it more than just like let me blow as much air through the horn as i can right yeah it's not about you know yeah people think that like big sound means just blow harder but um as far as that blowing air um 
you know, man, I just think you just have to just sit and practice and you kind of find that like with, with regard to specifically to shakes and stuff like that, you just kind of find that sweet spot. Like, um, yeah, basically like <clears throat> as far as like the old style hand shakes, it's just changing the pressure on the embouchure, which changes the partials. So you find that I, I, I'll play just a second. I had it sitting here. I was just demonstrating this to a student yesterday. You kind of find where the two notes meet and you just kind of keep it right there. So um, I don't know, let's just do it on like a, an E. I'm not doing anything with the tongue or anything. Maybe a little bit, maybe keeping it in that position where like the first note is a little high and, and the upper note's a little low. You find where it clicks together, but <clears throat> it's just sort of like just sitting there and figuring out stuff like that or like, you know, the way he would rip into notes. <laughs> stuff like that, yeah. you know. It, it, and, and like I said, it, it, <clears throat> it might just be me sitting, hearing a record and hearing something cool from like the Hotter Than That solo and then I'll just stop. And I might just spend like 10 minutes figuring out what that was. And, and you know, like I said, I was a little kid doing that. Like I, I literally walked into, you know, fifth grade band. We took <clears throat> my school, we had to take a whole year of private lessons without being in band. So I started in fourth grade, I was nine years old. And then in fifth grade, we could be an elementary band. So wow. I go walk in, I go walking into school and I'm, I'm literally going, I didn't know any better. I mm -hmm. saw Harry James do that and I heard it. I heard, I heard the vibrato and all the recordings and I saw the, you know, the Benny Goodman story and the Glenn Miller story and stuff. So that's just, what I heard is what I saw and I, I figured it out. So I just think um, it just takes some experimenting. And, and like I said, confidence. The biggest thing I find, <coughs> excuse me, with my students is when I try to get them to play some trad um, jazz or, or like early swing trumpet players studying those, you know, somebody like Buck Clayton or, or Sweets Edison or Harry James or Bunny Berrigan, whoever. Um, a lot of times they're just afraid. Because like, you know, like they want to play it safe. And so like, they don't want to embarrass themselves. So they're not going to do like the shakes or this or whatever. And I always say, just go for it. Mm -hmm. you have to be willing to just go for it. And uh, I guess that was like just a trait for me as a, as a little kid. And even now, like, I'm just not afraid. Like the guys in the blues always jive me because I might've like checked out something different before a concert or like wanted to try something else. And uh, somebody who just retired, who I already missed dearly, uh, Kenny Rittenhouse, was the same way. We would go up to the mic and solo, and there'd be some days where we just fell flat on our face. But you know what? I just wanted to try something. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to try it. What's the worst that can happen? I know it doesn't work. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. You know, some, every now and then when people are willing to just go for it, that is usually when the coolest things are discovered. And so you just have to be willing just to surrender yourself to the music and to the horn. And the other side thing that I'll say with regards to the horn, now that I'm older and have, you know, worked on pedagogy and, and technical ability, you know, for years now, and I kind of learned reversely where I did all the listening first, um, the trumpet has to be a non-entity because the second that the trumpet gets in the way, you're not going to be able to do these things. I mean, Harry James, the reason why he was so good is because he studied uh, from his father and out of the Arbenz book all the time. You know, you hear like Horace Staccato or something. I mean, there's, there's the most classical players who can't play that stuff. Mm -hmm. And Harry James played it, no problem. Where you hear his trumpet concerto, um, he was a circuit trumpet player as a young kid. So he's playing all this stuff for hours and hours and hours and all these little multiple tonguing lines and things like that. So for them, they were just virtuosos making the horn do exactly what they wanted to. So once you can get all the technical stuff out of the way and you make it a non-entity, then that's when you can figure out all the musical stuff and the nuance and things like that. Um, but it all starts with, as I said before, having just a crystal clear concept of like what exactly it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody who has, I think, a, a as crystal clear a concept of what the sound that they want, you know, I think there's not many greater examples than, than Wynton Marsalis. Like he, he has you know, <laughs> Wynton sound from, you know, it's sort of like Louie and, and it's sort of like 
um, uh, Harry James or even like Wayne who has his sound. Winton has his sound, you know, unashamedly. What, what is it? And he also, you know, greatly respects if you watch anything that he, that any talk that he's ever done, he very greatly respects Louis Armstrong and, Absolutely. and, 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 you know, the history of how swing trumpet and, and just bebop trumpet and jazz trumpet and how it all came up and he can do it all. What do you, what do you take away from, from Winton? What, you know, why, why do you have his picture on your wall? Well, so I, the very first, I think the very first trumpet video, I don't know why for me, and I'm sure maybe Jeff, you feel this way too, but like there's certain moments in life where I can close my eyes and like put myself in an exact situation. And I don't know why that situation sticks out, but it does. My dad was cutting grass outside and I was sitting, I got home from school. I sat down at the computer and at that point it was still like dial up or whatever. We're like, mm -hmm. My mom wanted to call on the phone. I had to get off the computer, but like I was able to get on the computer for a little bit and like YouTube had just come out. Um, and I, I saw this video of Marsalis on music. It was like a PBS special on like this big educational thing he did, which is great. And it was him playing cornet chop suey. And I was like, dang, I want to sound like that when I grow up. So that was the first time I heard Wynton Marsalis. And I told my mom, please buy me, because again, all I did was wanted to play to recordings. I didn't want to practice out of the Arbens or anything. I said, Mom, please, please buy me a Wynton Marsalis CD. I want to, you know, I want to hear more things. So she comes home with this, what I learned now later was a compilation album, but um, it was a, a record called Classic Winton. I got so excited. I ran into my bedroom, put the CD on, hit play, and I hear, bum, ba dum ba dum <laughs> Bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. I'm like, what is this? This is not right. And I go running out to my mom. I'm like, mom, this isn't right. <coughs> this, this isn't, isn't right. my house. <laughs> this, this isn't wrong. You know, Walmart branded this wrong or something. <laughs> and uh, went back and looked and was like, oh, man, that's Wynton Marsalis. So I ended up listening to the whole record, loved it. And at that point, I was like, all right, I'm practicing Arbins. So I got... <laughs> And, you know, I, so I went to my kid trumpet teacher about that and my band director, who was a ridiculously huge influence on me. Um, I, I went to them and, and showed them Winton and then I started learning more and everything. And I saw that like he won jazz and classical Grammy in the same exact year. And like I learned, discovered his, all of his work with Kathleen Battle, all the, you know, piccolo trumpet stuff. And then it's the Hyde and the Hummel and the Tomasi. And he just recorded all these great works. And then you hear him, then I would hear like stuff that he did with, you know, obviously Lincoln Center and his septet and, and all these other different groups. And it just like blew my mind that somebody was capable of that. And that, at the, that he was the deciding factor for me that proved that that was possible. You can be taken seriously as a classical musician and a jazz musician. It, it, they're not mutually exclusive from one another. You can totally do both respectively. Now, am I... Uh, more of a commercial or a jazz player yeah of course um but you know I, I i played with kevin paul quite a bit i still do quite a bit of classical work and i still get called to do those things um and and, and it's nice because it, it's nice to be able to go from one genre to the next and, and the more you play like i said when the trumpet is not an issue it's there the two styles or the two whatever you you know there's an infinite amount of styles you could play they're not all that different from one another like I said, it all comes down to having a crystal clear concept of what you want to sound like. You know, this is like kind of like my little wall of heroes. And I have all these various people that mean like so much to me. You're, you know, like Bud Herseth is up there who I heard at a really young age as well. And like that's that orchestral sound that I have in my ear. Vizzuti I see. Do I see Vizzuti? Vizzuti, one of our teachers. Obviously, Lewis is there. I have a whole Harry James case with one of his original part of a mouthpieces and an old program from his a concert that he signed and his horn and you know all kinds of other things um all these people i guess kind of together made the concoction that i am whether that's good or bad you know uh, i wouldn't say it's bad <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah i don't think so either i really enjoy all those players and, and all had their <clears throat> unique influence in me um i think too just um it, broader thinking more broadly um seeing the effect that harry james had on me and Wynton marsalis and, and a lot of these other players um 
you know, some people, and I found this to be true when I was studying at North Texas, there were some incredible students there, but some players, um, and they know because they would jive me for this at school, some people were just trying to find their own voice, which is not a bad thing. You know, I had a teacher tell me that once. They're like, when are you just going to play yourself? Um, but being able, and I know that Winton has talked about this a lot with regards to like Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie and things like that, being able to just shout this stuff off, you know, whether it's a Louis Armstrong solo or Lee Morgan, is, having studied the lineage, you, you will end up, you will develop your own voice by a concoction of all these little players that you listen to. You know, I've just named a few off that had a huge, huge inspiration um, on me. Um, so, I, you know, just some players, I guess, are, are trying to be so inventive or trying to just work on themselves that they don't study the lineage. And I, I try to really make that impression on my students that you, you have to look back first. You have to do that stuff first. Everybody did. It was like, you know, I discovered, thanks to a good friend of mine, a recording of Charlie Parker in 1949 playing Cheryl, which is a blues. And out of nowhere, he just shoots off the West End blues cadenza that Louis Armstrong played. I mean, it's literally incredible. And that was all the evidence I needed to prove that those guys were checking out their forefathers as well. Somebody as inventive as Charlie Parker was still looking backwards. So it's possible to drive forward and look in the rear view mirror. Yeah. That's, that's something that I, I have struggled with for sure. I, I definitely admittedly listen to more modern players. Like for example, I was, uh, some of my friends are more like, yeah, but are you listening to Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, you know, those kind of people. And I was like, yeah, but have you heard Chad LB, um, left quits Brown and, he, I think he's just incredible. And they say, well, what, what is he doing new? Everyone's done that before. He's just doing it at like the highest level. He's doing it absolutely incredibly. But people, you know, people made that possible for him to do that. Um, so I definitely, and, and I, you know, I respect that you and Winton and, and those, like, I, I want to do more of that. For example, I watch, I have watched and listened to probably Winton Marsalis more than, any far more than anybody music wise yeah. um and i think from uh, one reason i think that is is because it's easy to hear his blues style his new orleans style he has you know the louis armstrong style the the bebop style class, you know like he can do just about everything so it's it's mm -hmm. it's not a monotonous thing to listen to uh Witten play all that much um and one one last thing that i think is really cool about him um is when you have somebody at that high of a level playing, someone consider him like, you know, most would consider him amongst the highest um, level of, of trumpet players. Mm -hmm. And when, and he was, you know, born and raised, grew up, learned the trumpet in New Orleans and things like that to hear him play New Orleans, you know, Dixieland style or like, you know, dirge style music. Yeah. Right. To hear yeah. The, yeah. To hear the convergence of, one of the best jazz musicians in the world and somebody who's so natively and innately in that style to hear those two things come together is one of the most magical things in my opinion. Pretty incredible. Pretty, you know, if you haven't checked out his, um, uh, standard time volume six, I think it's called Mr. Jelly Lord. It's a tribute to Jelly Roll Morton. Mm -hmm. Um, oh my gosh, his playing on that is ridiculous. Hearing all that New Orleans jazz come to life and, and just like some of the, I think it's Black Bottom Stomp. I've been working on that solo for a while. Oh my gosh, it's it's just incredible, you know. And for him, obviously, trumpet is just not an issue. At and all. his ear is so connected to trumpet, his facility, he can play exactly what he's hearing. And I've heard him talk about Louis Armstrong that way. For him, mm -hmm. you say the the trumpet was a non-entity for him. It was just from his brain out the bell of his horn. Mm -hmm. Whatever he wanted to play, it just came out. Yeah, which, which is so cool. It's not where I'm at, <laughs> and and I oh, right there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other sort of style. I know you know you you put a, a lot of stuff out there in a wide range of styles. And um, again, if if anybody has not followed you, I think Instagram is one of the coolest things these days for musicians. Um, what are you, are you TPT Josh? Oh, Josh TPT. My Josh? Instagram. Josh yeah, TPT. 
Josh TPT on Instagram. So much incredible stuff to watch. Um, uh, your, your lead stuff at UNT, you, you went to school with some, with some good playing cats over there. Um, yeah. The guy, I, there's a couple, two guys that I've, I've recently, not super recently, but recently followed on Instagram. Um, is it Brian? Brian Fincher. Fincher. Brian Fincher. Yeah. Um, I saw his stuff before and then I, I saw his stuff and I saw your stuff. And then you mentioned each other, like put it, put something, a video of you guys playing together. Um, yeah. He's phenomenal. And who's the guy that just won the job? Nick uh, Osick, my brother. Yeah. He's like a brother to me. Yeah. He's, he's doing some really yeah. cool stuff too. He yeah. has an incredible There's another sound. group called Luke Wingfield. The Luke four Wingfield. of us, uh, we have like this endless group chat. We, we talk pretty much every single day. Mm-hmm. Like Luke, text actually just a few hours ago that was like here a flat rhythm changes here's the play along link one take go <laughs> that's so cool <laughs> like a flat rhythm changes challenge with each other um yeah i i mean there were just some incredible musicians not just trumpet players but trumpet studio was really strong at the time i was there um but just there were so many just insanely productive and talented musicians at North Texas when I was there. But Nick definitely holds a special place in my heart. We go back, I don't know, like a decade or something like that. Mm-hmm. He, he's, he's phenomenal, phenomenal player. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, there's a bunch of cool videos of you guys playing. I know I've seen Cherokee over and over that arrangement of Cherokee mm-hmm. is so cool. Also watching Brian McDonald <clears throat> play Cherokee with, you know, with Airman and notice. Yeah. Um, is super that that arrangement is just so cool and and it is fun know, chart. Ha, showing people both recordings of it and and you know seeing a college group do it is is really cool um you weren't at north texas with mike league were you bass player mike league from snarky puppy no 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 they they all would have been before me before you okay north texas until um fall of 2013 you were there until I was there 13 from- Oh, you were there. No, I started there in thirteen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I started there in thirteen. I graduated call um, high school in two thousand twelve, um, and I started at North Texas in twenty thirteen, and I was there until twenty seventeen. I was there four years. Yeah, is that where you learned your your uh, uh, technique, your pedagogy, or your your uh, yeah. approach to the face and and equipment and things like that? A lot of that stuff, yeah. I was really fortunate. <clears throat> we all were at the time. The time I was there, and it's not because of me, but we, the trumpet players were, at, we had such a unique experience, especially like Luke, Brian, Nick, myself, and there were a ton of others. Um, when we were there, we were sort of at the end of some professors' careers. And then we would have interns, and then we would have the new professor. And so I think during my four years there, I had 10 different trumpet professors that I studied with. And so it allowed me to have this like huge stockpile of knowledge about, you know, whatever, embouchure, technique, gear, anything you could possibly imagine. And they all had so many different ideas. Like it it would almost sometimes become difficult because like, you know, Vizzuti would tell me one thing and, and, and Jay Saunders would say another or this or that or whatever. And it's not that any one player disagreed. It's just, they all had different, ideas and they were all willing to like you know it, it, I say this to my students it might not work for you but I want you to try it mm-hmm. that's the only way you're going to learn if it doesn't work you know I have you name the trumpet method I've done it I've at least tried everything and then you figure out what will work for you um, but that was such a cool experience for me in my time there and, and like I said because I wanted to play I was playing lead in one big band always and then I was playing like I was playing lead in the one o'clock, playing j- the jazz chair in the two o'clock, and then I was in like a brass quintet or a chamber orchestra or something because I wanted to cover all sides of the horn. And so that always led to as well having like two to three trumpet lessons a week with three different people. Um, Nick and I both did that. And it, w- it got to be really hard. But, um, you know, again, you're, you're at college for four years. That's the time to do the work. You know, everyone can go out and party, do this, do that, whatever. And that's cool. We have to be human beings as well. Um, but you you commit yourself to learning and honing your skills for four years. So that way, when push comes to shove and, and you graduate, boom, there you are. I mean, <laughs> it's crazy that Nick and I were the two Pennsylvania All-State lead trumpet players for two years in a row. And we did not get along at first, believe it or not. That's a funny story. 
But then we went to North Texas with each other and worked together there, lived together for four years, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, the Army has two premier jazz bands. He's playing lead in one, and I'm playing lead in the other. And the two of us worked and worked and worked. You know, we spent long nights in the practice rooms together and playing together and sharing ideas about trumpet. Um, that would be my advice for anyone that's watching that might be in college or high school or whatever, is I think it's really, really helpful to have a buddy in school to just constantly kind of have that go-to source. In some ways, I would say I almost learned more from him than I did from anyone else in my time there. Because he would take a lesson with like Professor Holt, John Holt there, uh, one of our classical teachers. And then I would take a lesson with Bazzuti or he would be with Tanya Darby or, or I'd be with Paul Stevens. And then we'd converse mm -hmm. about what we learned, what the conflicting ideas were, what both were, you know, what things do they have in common and things like that. And um, I, I just, I can't say enough good things about the players that were there when I was there and the professors. Um, you know, especially, well, they all have a special place in my heart, but Alan especially um, is very, spe is near and dear to me for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, with that, having, having a buddy, um, I have a similar, ex had a similar experience. I lived for three years with um, one of my you know best friends who we both got there the same year. We both took four and a half ish, five years because um, we we started doing other stuff and then we decided mm -hmm. to do music. Um, sure. he, he decided to do performance. I decided to do Ed. And we had different um, uh, different sort of interests when it came to the trumpet. I started a group that played at you know fraternity parties and and bars, and I loved getting up and playing without music and and making it up on the spot. You know, like, yeah. just like horn licks and and funk stuff and playing you know big band gigs with people that came through or playing recordings doing doing that side of stuff whereas my roommate wilson childers who you know busted his butt for five years four years five years whatever it was and you know i admittedly i flatlined what because i wasn't doing as much practicing I, I was so fascinated with like the performing of the stuff that i could do and he just wanted to keep going and he's now studying uh getting his master's at juilliard and phenomenal classical trumpet player absolutely amazing will win a job you know very soon um sure. but just and he's sort of a, a, a testament to what you were saying where if you're just going for it non-stop thirsty for you know knowledge and and in the practice room to all hours of the night he is that guy and he you will you will know his name at some point yeah um you know yeah. i mean it, it's no secret on how to, just, just do it you know, yeah i mean some people sure there there might be like I, I do believe there might be some degree of like natural talent but mm -hmm. at the end of the day i've seen players especially like when i was at north texas that started like rock bottom and they, they were one of the most killing players by the time they got out of there because there were those of us that like when i was a freshman i made the two o'clock lab band and i didn't even look on that side like they released the board um, after the auditions and we have nine lab bands there. And so they had all the things and I'm over here looking at like the bottom. I didn't even bother looking over here mm -hmm. and everyone's like, Whoa, Kaufman, you're over there. And how foolish was I that I was like, all right, cool. You know, I thought I was the big hotshot freshman. And then like a semester goes by and all of a sudden all these players start sounding incredible. And I was like, my first semester, I was just like coasting. I'm like, all right, enough of this. It's time to get the work done, you know, because the best players are the ones that are going to get the gigs um and so there was you know I, I guess i just um i got a little ahead of myself and i got too comfortable where i was um but you know doc severinson is doc severinson because he treated trumpet like an eight to five job every day winton you know there's there are stories of Winton like in juilliard like standing in the corner of a room playing single tonguing attacks trying to perfect his attack like there's no secret to this thing the, the only other thing i would leave you with um with the idea of that is, is I tell my students to deliberately practice. You know, it's one thing where, you know, you're not fooling anybody when you say, oh yeah, I practice six hours a day. And I quickly learned, I've been there, done that, where like you go into a practice room and you just like open the Clark book and you just start playing or you open the arm and you start playing. That, that's not practicing. I mean, sure, you're getting FaceTime in, you might be helping endurance, but nothing else is really improving. You're just stagnating. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was something that Mr. Vizzuti really, really shoved into my thought process was like you have to deliberately practice and at any point in time whatever you're playing you should stop and say 
what is my goal in playing this? You know, what am I trying to improve by working on such and such a thing? And I noticed that um, I practice a lot less than I ever used to, but I've improved a lot more as well. Because when I am sitting down for maybe 45 minutes at a time, it's like incredibly focused thinking about all the mechanisms or music or this or that or whatever it is I'm trying to improve rather than like, oh, I practice three hours a day and I'm just, you know, blowing through the Arbin's book. Mm -hmm. So there's no secret on how to become the best player in the world. It just takes an, a huge amount of dedication, you know, yeah. and constant practicing. Absolutely. Um, so you're, you're up in, I, I, I was, I was thinking about talk, asking you about the whole embouchure thing. It's a very nuanced thing that maybe we could talk about another time. The only reason I was thinking about, but I thought about you when I was doing, I was in a Louis Downswell masterclass the other day and he, okay. started, he started throwing out numbers like three, a four, whatever. And I was like, I've heard that one other time in my life. And that was Josh Kaufman. Um, I don't, I honestly don't understand it, but I would love to, at some point when hopefully all this is done, I would love to come up and, and, and sit down with you and you tell me all the things that I need to do better because um, I know that I'm doing you know stuff wrong and I need mm -hmm. help with that. Um, but I did, I was wondering about like the scene up there. Okay. I, so, um, I'm from DC. I don't know if, if I told you that last time I'm from DC. Well, I studied with Dave Detweiler there and everything. Yeah. Um, and I'm fa I love YouTube and, and looking at, you know, my favorite bands are the, the blues and the airmen of no, um, love listening to both of those bands. Oh, what, thanks, man. Yeah. I mean, just incredible playing. Um, I've always, I've always, uh, looked out for Ken McGee because my mom went to high school with him and he always talked about him and everything. And he, you know, he's worked on my horn since I was little and everything. Um, and he has, you know, Ken's sound. You have your lead sound. Brian has his lead sound. What are, are there like, you know, differences or what people are looking for, how people play or, or, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, I would have to argue that in Washington, D.C., you have more professional brass players in the district than anywhere else in the world. Because you're talking about the President's Own Marine Band, Pershing's Own Army Band, the Navy Band, the Air Force Band, the National Symphony Orchestra, the, uh, the opera. I mean, plus, like, all the retired guys like Dave that stay here. Mm -hmm. They put up camp here. And then there are even some killing. There's a guy named Craig Taylor who's a really good friend of mine a killing civilian trumpet player who plays a huge majority of all the shows in the union work. And he, uh, you know, works with Dave a lot and we'll be on sections together and things like that. But he spent a lot of time in his career uh, with touring Broadway shows and he worked in New York city for a while with all these people. There are so many killing players that, um, you know, well, here's the nice part about the military gigs is like, if you play one gig this week and the next week they call somebody else, Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. It's like really, I can't speak for everybody, but when you're in a, in a situation where like that is your livelihood, it's obviously a lot more competitive. And that's not to say it's not competitive here, but there is a really cool camaraderie about all the service bands, and sp specifically to the commercial players, the guys in all the big bands. There's this really cool camaraderie between all of us where we all call each other for gigs. We all call each other to sub everyone's a good player everyone's gonna be able to play the gig and so i mean aside from maybe a few occasions where like somebody is doing something with a lot of harry james like ken and i uh ken mcgee and i both do probably a vast majority if not all of the swing stuff in town and there's quite a bit there's the uh, dc lindy hop exchange they hold the international uh lindy hop championships here in dc and it's always ken mcgee me and like last year, it was uh, John Kelso, who we all know and love from New York City, who plays mm -hmm. with Urbano. He's an incredible uh, player. Um, so Ken and I, Ken, his hero is also Harry James and some other players. He and I get along really well because we both come from a similar background and have a similar sound concept. I when loved hearing, listening to his uh, hair, recording of the Harry James concerto with, uh, with, with the concert. Sound. Yeah. yeah. It's That's really, like unbelievable playing. It's really good. So we come from that similar background. So he and I just click. Mm -hmm. So most bands in town, when, when, it's a, when, they, when they hire us over at the Spanish ballroom or one of the dancing things, 
they'll usually hire the two of us. And, and he could play lead, nice solo, or we split the lead book. And, you know, there's a couple other good solos in town. Um, but we get along really well. You know, if somebody wants like a bunch of double high C's on a recording, where, just call BMAC. He's your guy. <laughs> but but he, like Brian plays, he's played with the NSO, uh, Mark Wood and Dave Detwell. There's so many amazing players in town that you could hire almost anybody and, and the job is going to get done and it's going to get done in an incredibly high level. Well, That's you guys what, swap too. I've seen, I've seen both you and Ken play with the, uh, with the airman and note before. Yeah. Now. Yeah, you know, if, if, if one of those guys goes on leave or something or they're on uh, one of their vacation days or they're doing training or whatever, we'll do like what's called a um, sister manning request. And like they'll come out, you know, they'll use like if they need a jazz trumpet player, they'll bring me over or Graham Breedlove has played with them before or whomever. Um, and Brian has played lead for us before, you know, if somebody's out or, or, or something like that. And, and that's a lot of fun, too, because we get to work with each other sort of in the military, in our jobs. But then on the outside, you know, you show up to like, um, I, I uh, the Eric Felton Jazz Orchestra, who's one of the like most well-known groups here in town. We recorded a live album at Blues Alley last year. It was a Wellington's Nutcracker, and the section was me, Ken McGee, Lisa Whitaker, Tom Eby, and Craig Frederick. So like all of us except for Tom are in the army, either the army blues or the jazz ambassadors. And like, so is the whole rest of the band. And, and so that, I mean, <laughs> it's incredible, incredible to me that we show up and play that gig every year. We'll do the Ellington Nutcracker four, four um, shows there without ever rehearsing, just nothing. We just show up and play and it sounds the way it does. It, it is like stupidly good to hear some of these players play and they just don't miss. Um, you know, I'm, it's, it's weird because you know, you and I aren't that far apart in age. I grew up literally listening to Ken McGee. Mm -hmm. I think he skipped off to basic training the month I was born. I'm, I'm almost positive he, he, he went to basic training in June of 1994, which is when I was born. So I've been listening to him in the concert band. And then when he joined the blues, I grew up listening to Dave Detweiler, very similar to you. And I grew up listening to Brian McDonald, which is all that got me thinking about joining a service band. And now he calls me on the way home to talk about teeth and embouchure. So I'm still... It, <laughs> It almost freaks them out sometimes because I'm still just like, you're like, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, I, I don't know. This is like literally a dream of mine and you're sitting right in front of me. It, it, it's, it's a weird crazy. So I, I'm just happy to play whatever gigs come my way and I just show up. And I try to sit on the fourth book, but it's like the swing books. Everyone <laughs> avoids the solo book and I show up and they're like, you're down there, buddy. And I'm like, oh, you know, and I've got to play in front of like Lisa. I'm like, oh, yeah. It's um, crazy how many how many musicians there are up there. I miss being up there and, and going to Blues Alley. I saw I saw Dave's Christmas concert every year. There were years where I saw it. Oh, the White House, the, the White House band. Yeah, there were yeah. years where I was setting up for him, and I saw it like six different places in a year. But I've seen it every year for twelve years, and heard wow. this, the Gosh. same the same setup for each tune. The same intros, the same arrangements, and I just, uh, it's so, it's, you know, I can, I can say, I mean, I can recite everything he says, and it's just so nostalgic, and it's so, <laughs> like, that's just where, you know, what I grew up listening to, and it, I right. feel so lucky to, to do that, and, and, you know, knowing the players up there, or knowing who they are, I played, I played, um, Dave asked me, and one of his students, Joe Donegan, um, who I went to, yeah, yeah, I, I played one or two things with him, um, and we were doing a, a Herald Trumpet thing at the National Portrait Gallery. I was like a sophomore in high school, had never played a Herald Trumpet before, <laughs> and we drove in to D.C. in like a moving van, or like, a, like, a, like a white van, and it was me, Dave, I think it was Joe, if it wasn't Joe, it was another student, and Rod Rossi. Uh, and we were standing like I was next to Dave and the other Raj and the other guy were, were across this huge, you know, balcony <laughs> over these people in tuxes and ball gowns at a dinner at the National Portrait Gallery. I was like, yeah. what, what am I doing? What, <laughs> just crazy stuff. But yeah, and Dave's like, oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You'll figure it out. You'll hear it. Exactly. And I, yeah. I'm sure what came out my bell, like <laughs> 10 miles away from me, it was not what I was thinking was going to come out. Uh, it's, it's hard to play those things. Yeah. 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 Dave's got, I've played those sets of heralds uh, on like a, there's like a new Orleans Mardi Gras event here every year. And I've been really lucky to have the chance to play there now for a few years in a row. And it's like Tommy Williams, who if you don't know, Tommy Williams is like one of the most killing jazz players. 
I know people have heard him. Like, he played with Carnegie Hall Jazz Band with John Faddis, and, like, he's done some stuff. He was the blues guy. He was in the blues with Dave, right? Blues and the JAs, actually, for a time. And then you have, like, Detweiler on the other side, and I'm just sitting in the middle going, like, what am I doing? Why am I here? <laughs> you could have called anybody. And then Dave's so like, oh, you're playing lead tonight. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you sort of have his job, don't you? I mean, basically what he did, he was sort of like the solo and lead guy. Yeah, I get, yeah, yeah, I got hired as the fifth player for the Blues originally. There was no lead playing at all on my audition. It was just small group and big band soloing. That's what I got hired to do. Yeah. And then just since the section, you know, guys have retired and this and that, I showed an interest in playing lead. One of the guys um, was dealing with some, some stuff, and so I started playing more. Well, really, since day one, you know, Ken and Mark were like, if you want to play lead, just let us know, and they might pass stuff down. And I just – eventually just moved further and further towards the middle of the section pretty much what i you know now ken and i play the lead and we've hired jazz players one who like basically took my spot and then i took somebody else's so mm -hmm. yeah it's like dave and you know like you carry this legacy of like dave and lisa whitaker and mark wood and it's it it's um it's really humbling you know it, it um it makes you go to work trying to make them in, in a weird way make them proud you know like because like even when i play with lisa i'm thinking like i literally like watch videos of her and listen to recordings of her when i was like in middle school and high school you know and here i am sitting next to her it was like the same thing studying with alan bazuti you know it's just like um it, it 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 i don't know it's just a really humbling thing to actually see players of that caliber in the flesh and when they're just as beautiful as a human being as, as, as they all are, and then as equally incredible as a trumpet player. Um, it's like, it's a kind of a surreal experience, especially if you're somebody who's like very sentimental, like I am, like, I'm just a big teddy bear. You know, I grew up with my granddad, you know, I'm just like a little old man, you know, and I just sit next to these players and I just, I, you know, want to hear their stories and bug them about equipment and, you know, how to play and what are they, what are their thoughts on this or that or embouchure or, or whatever. Well, that's why and, I'm trying uh, to do, do this stuff right here. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to win that job. I'm not going to go play with you, but like the, you know, the, the ability to, I, you know, look at your playing. I look at Kevin's playing. I look at Louis Dowdsville's playing, uh, Vinny's playing, Dave's playing. And I want to sit, you know, just say, where did you come from? How did you get here? And like, what are you doing so that I can do a little well, bit? Well, never say never. Well, uh, who, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But I, I mean, this, this was the second audition I ever took in my life. So that's the one thing that in my teaching studio that I cannot talk about is audition experience. Cause I won my second job interview. Yeah. And the one, the, my first one was three days before this one. Uh, <laughs> You know, so I don't have a ton of audition experience, but had you told me I would have won these jobs, I went walking into the attitude of like, okay, this I need to get the experience. Maybe I can win the gig. And, you know, here we are. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel very, very fortunate and, and blessed. And uh, I guess this was the path that I was deemed to be on. You know, I don't know. So I'm just trying to do the best I can. But, uh, you know, never say never. You, you never know. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe I'll start playing a little bit more and, and make my way up there. We'll see. Yeah. Hey, we'll have a lead trumpet vacancy in a couple of years. So we'll have two trumpet vacancies in a few years. So we'll see. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be praying. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, but Josh, I really appreciate you coming on here. I don't want to take up the rest of your day. Um, oh, you're but, fine. But, uh, you know, I think all this stuff is stuff that, that musicians, you know, like me or, or other people who are interested in this stuff or, or would really benefit from and, and, you know, the reason I, I really wanted to do one with Dave, which I, I just posted the other day, um, is because I heard all of these stories for 15 years and they're stories that other people should hear. And, they're, you know, yeah. you know, people don't have the opportunity to, to sit down. You know, you don't have the opportunity to sit down with a bunch of people, you know, so, so just like chatting and, and hearing a little bit about what, what makes you tick and what, what you grew up on and your influences, I, I hope that other people get a little bit out of it. Um, I think, I think they will. And, and yeah. I have a bunch of other, I'm, I'm trying to get people from different, um, you know, talk to people from different backgrounds. You know, you're a big band guy, you know, Dave's a retired big band guy. Vinny's a recording guy. Louis a solo guy, you know, just, just trying to get mm. a little bit of a, you know, a taste of what, what people are doing these days and yeah, I'm hoping to stay busy during, during quarantining. Um, a good way to spend quarantine. And, and I really appreciate you having me on here. And, and I mean, you said best, 
um, you and I may have even talked about this once. Like, I was never afraid to reach out to like, you know, like uh, Wayne Berger and I uh, and I have become good friends, and we were t just talking about embouchure and stuff uh, a couple weeks ago for a while, and like some people were like, "Well, how did you become friends with him?" And I was like, I was like a fourteen-year-old on Facebook saying, "Hi, Mr. Bergeron, my name's so and so, blah blah blah." These players and guys like Dave and, and Lisa and Brian McDonald, whoever. They're incredibly beautiful people and they're killing players. They want, you know, the only way this stuff is going to get passed on is if somebody asks. So, you know, I'm trying to do the same thing you do. If I'm sitting next to Dave, I just want, just teach me, tell me something that I can walk away with having that golden nugget. And nine times out of 10, I get it. Um, so I think what you're doing is a really great thing that people can look up, you know, you know, go to YouTube and check out the uh, musicians insight podcast for, you know, years to come and have like this plethora of information. You know, I was just watching Dave's interview uh, this afternoon and uh, he's got, guy. you know, some really great stories and stuff. So mm -hmm. I think what you're doing is great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, really appreciate your time. Um, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Maybe do another podcast in a few months and just, you know, yeah. I, I, I have a million more questions. Um, so we'll do something yeah, again. Soon. Like here we could do trumpet specific stuff, you know, to talk about embouchure and gear and all that, all that good stuff. Absolutely. All right, Josh, thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you, man. All right, take care.